our prayers, our minds are certainly with Cheryl Bethard and her family, Frank's family today, mindful of them. That funeral service is at 4 o'clock this afternoon at Caraway Funeral Home, if you can make that. I want to start us off today with a passage of scripture. It's in John 4 and 21. The Bible says, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Would you stand with me this morning? He said, the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Devotion I was reading says, Jesus was inaugurating a new age in which people would not have to travel to a physical temple in a certain city to worship but they would be able to worship God in every place because the Holy Spirit would dwell inside of them. We know that happened on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost fell and it, for the first time in history, indwelt humanity. The Holy Ghost came inside of believers and they became the temple of the Lord. This morning, if you want to worship God in spirit and in truth, why don't you just lift your hands with me? We're going to invite the presence of the Lord in this place. God, we're here to worship you today. You said in your word that the Father was seeking such to worship him. God, you said that you desire worship, Lord. Today, God, we worship and exalt your name. If you'd like, you can join us as we worship the Lord all across this house. Why don't you come and let's worship the Lord together.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, lift your hands and tell him he's good. Say thank you for. Say you're thankful for what he's done. Tell him thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing me. Thank you for my family. Thank you for this church. Thank you for all you have done, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. We bless your name. Hallelujah. 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 It is good to be here with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. You are good, God. Hallelujah. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, God is good. God is good. Hallelujah. You can make your way back to your seats for the moment. Um, we're going to be doing something different again this morning. Our ushers are going to be starting us off. We're going to start our service right now. Uh, we started with worship in voice and song. And now we're going to worship him with our giving. And our ushers are going to make their way through uh through the pews and hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we want to honor you. You have been so good to us. God, I know it's nothing compared to what you have done, but we want to honor you and worship you with our giving and say thankful, say thank you for all you have done. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Our ushers are going to make their way to you. While that's happening, um, I want to remind you of a few announcements we have going on. Uh, today at 2 o'clock, at 2 o'clock, we have our nursing home service at Parkwood in the Pines. Um, if you can be a part of that, you say, well, I don't, I don't sing, I don't preach, that's okay. Many of them would just like to talk to you and have you pray for them. So if you can do that, Please be at Parkwood at the Pines at 2 o'clock, and you will be a blessing to them. Um, also today, uh, we do have a funeral um, for uh, Frank Bethard, um, that is Sister Bethard's husband. Uh, that is at 4 o'clock at Caraway. Um, so we are... If you can be there to support our sister, please be there. Um, and then we will not be having service tonight, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, we are postponing our prayer. Uh, and the last announcement I have on here, oh, I have two, I apologize. First is Girls of Grace is next weekend at Eastview, if you have your tickets to that. If you have any questions, please see Jessa Mahaney. Uh, and she can answer all of your questions. And then there is a Young Marrieds game night. Young Marrieds, April 26th at 7 o'clock. You do not want to miss out on that. Um, hallelujah. Where's Sherea? Hey, Sherea, how, are, how do we know if we're in Young Marrieds? Tell us in the mic. Look in the mirror. Stop it. <laughs> 37 and younger. 37 and younger. All right. So if you are 37 and younger, you're part of Young Marrieds. And married. Yeah, you, you need to be married to be part of Young Marrieds. That wasn't clear. So we're just going to stop there before this gets any worse. Hallelujah. Will you stand with me? Um, we're going to worship the Lord by greeting each other and just showing some love to each other. So please get out of your seat, shake someone's hand. If you don't recognize somebody like I did last week and they've been coming here a month, well, you better introduce yourself today. This is your moment. <laughs> so please get out of your seat, shake someone's hand and say, you look good in the presence of God.
somebody begin to lift up your voice to the King of Kings. If you believe that in this place, that God is able to do all the things that we ask. Not only that, he can do so much more because he is the creator of all things. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And we come to worship him today. The foundations are shaking and every curse is breaking. The strongholds are falling and greater things are coming. Foundations are shaking. Oh, sing it together. And every curse is breaking. The strongholds, strongholds are falling. I will provide. 
this morning but as they sing in this song I, I got to thinking about something life gets rough we get dried out we get a lot of pressure on us we lose our zeal sometimes we feel like God's a million miles away but he is so close I want to tell you a little story so some of you know it's not a real secret that I don't throw things away uh, I repurpose just about everything and that's that's good and bad so um, quite, quite some time ago, we'll just leave it at that, my wife likes these little pumpkins, decorative, you know, gourds, I guess. They're kind of small and pretty. And so we, we had bought some of those, and I thought they were pretty, so I don't want to throw them away, you know, just keep them. So I kept them, and then I kept them some more, and then I kept them some more, and then kept them some more. And they were quite dry and crusty, kind of, you know, they quite dried out, lost all their color. They're very thin and brittle. And I thought, you know, what I do is I save that stuff because when I really want to score points, then I could throw something away and it makes my wife happy. <laughs> so that was one of the least things I could give up. So I went and I got them and I thought, before I, before I just throw these away, so I cracked them open. I began to crack them open, and they had a seed inside. They had a bunch of seeds inside of them. So I took these old, dried-out gourds and busted them open and got that dried-out seed that looked plumb hopeless. It didn't look like much. And I found a pot that is broken really bad, so it can't be visible. It's hid out back. So I found that pot that broken pot and I put the dry seeds in the broken pot and of course it's rained I kind of forgot about it and I went out I put a bunch of them if a little will do a little good then a whole lot will do a whole lot of good just don't take medicine that way that's not how it works so in a broken pot with dry seed and a little bit of water and I happened on that the other day, Hunter. I walked out and I saw that and I'd forgotten it. And them suckers are standing about that high, just as green and live and beautiful as you could possibly imagine. It's just, just phenomenal. And so I say to you today, you may be a broken pot, you may be dried out, but just a little bit of the presence of the Lord uh, can fix things. Uh, he can work in our heart. He can do amazing things. Uh, I wish you'd just plug in right now and sing, O barren land. Uh, sing with this praise team right now. Uh, lift your voice. Open your hands. Uh, open your heart. Open your mouth. Uh, lift, lift up your voice to God. Uh, let it
into his riches and glory. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Old things pass away. Behold, everything is made new. Hallelujah. This situation is temporary, but our God is eternal. Hallelujah. Our trust is in you, Lord. Our strength is in you, Lord. Our joy is in you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. ways in the wilderness you're making rivers in the desert you're making ways in the wilderness you're making rivers in the desert sing it with me say you're, you're making, making ways in the wilderness you're making rivers in the desert oh you're making ways in the wilderness Making rivers in the desert. You're making ways, you're making ways in the wilderness. Oh, we believe it. You're making rivers in the desert. Oh, you're making ways in the wilderness. You're making ways, you're making rivers in the desert. Step out. The Spirit of God is 
so thick in this place and he's pouring out a refreshing move of the Holy Ghost. Like Pastor said, you may feel dry. You may feel brittle. But the Spirit of God is pouring out into this place to refresh and restore right now. You're making ways in the wilderness. You're making rivers in my desert. You're making ways in my wilderness. Oh, you're making the rivers in the desert. You're making ways in the wilderness. You're making rivers in the desert. Oh, yes, you are. You're making ways in the wilderness. You're making rivers in the desert. You're making ways in the wilderness. All together in this place. You're making rivers in the desert. You're making ways. You're making ways in the wilderness. You're making rivers in the desert. You're making ways. You're making ways in the wilderness. Yes, you are. You're making rivers in the desert. As our ministry team makes their way to this altar, we want to keep the Spirit of God moving in this place today. We want to transition to our time of prayer. If you're new to Cornerstone, this is the time in our service where we anoint and we believe and we pray for your needs. This isn't just a traditional church where we come, you hear three songs, a sermon, and you go home. But I just want you to take a second and just look across this place and see the people that fill this congregation. Because every single one of them 
has a testimony of a need that they had and God met it. They may still have a need right now, but they know and they can tell you of the many times that God has met them over and over and over again. And I was looking up this passage of scripture in Isaiah and I really liked the NIV version. As, as a nurse, one of my biggest pet peeves of coming on to my shift is there being work left for me. I, you know, I come on to my shift and I'm expecting everything to be done from the night shift so I can continue my job and do what I need to do. But then sometimes I come on and I'm surprised by the work that's left for me. But I was reading this scripture, and it says in verse 2, this is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you, do not be afraid, Jacob, my servant, whom I have chosen, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in the meadows, like poplar trees, by flowing streams. And some will say, I belong to the Lord. And others will call themselves by the name of Jacob. And others will write on their hand, the Lord's and will take the name Israel. And this is what the Lord says. Israel's kings and redeemer, the Lord Almighty, I am the first and I am the last. And apart from me, there is no God. And my favorite part was at the very beginning. He who made you and who formed you in the womb and who will help you. He was there at the beginning of my problems and he is there at the end of my problems. He is the author and the finisher of my faith. At the beginning of my trial, he was there and at the end of my trial, I know he is already there. And I am so thankful that I have a God that's already took care of everything. That's already been at the end of my trial. That's taken care of every single need that I have. I may feel like I'm in a desert or in a wilderness. And I'm trying to feel my way through a place where I can't even see. Or I'm fumbling to even just find myself. But the God who formed me in the womb. Who knew me before I was even born. Was there at the very end. Already taking care of all of it. And I encourage you in this place to step out in faith, and I say this all the time, it's not that God can't touch you in your seat, because he can. He is not limited by these green chairs. He is so much stronger than that. The point is, is that when you step out of the seat, and when that you step out on the faith, and that when you step out in front, you are the one that's claiming it, and you are the one that's telling God, I believe you can do it. You're already here, ready to do it, and I'm ready to receive it. These men of God that are across this place will anoint you with oil. So I encourage you in this place, if we could all stand as one body and one accord and one mind and go to the, go to the Lord in prayer and begin to lift up our voices for these needs. We have people that are sick. We have people that need healings. We have people that need encouragement. I encourage you to make your way up to this front and don't leave this church the same way that you came in. Leave with encouragement. Leave with some strength. Leave in a better mindset than the way you came in. Amen. Let's lift up our hands right now and lift up our voices. Lord, we come to you, Jesus, knowing that you are the author and the finisher, that you are the great physician, Lord, that you are the peace that goes beyond all understanding. Lord, and we put it all in your hands, Jesus, for we know that you have it all in control, Lord. Lord, that healings would be loosed right now in Jesus' name, that blessings would come out, Lord, according to your word and to your way, Jesus. Lord, the people that need encouragement in their spirits and in their hearts, Lord, let it be done right now in Jesus' name. I rebuke depression right now. 
now. And I rebuke anxiety and I speak against you fear that you have no place in this church that we call Cornerstone, that we call our family. And I cast you out right now into outer darkness. Angels, I release you across this building, Lord, and I plead your blood in Jesus' name over this congregation and over these people that not only healings of the body would take place, but healings of the mind and of the spirit would be done right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Come right now as this worship team leads us right now. Lift up your voice. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus.
tell you a real quick story brother and sister Parker I want you to come we owe this couple a huge debt while they were here working in our children's ministry the Parkers got a burden and felt a call on the Basham's life now you got to understand I'm old school so they came to me and they said brother Boone we sent something about the Basham's and we would love to use them in Sunday school and I said, ain't no way. They only come on Sunday morning. Now, if Sunday morning only is your thing, cool. It ain't how I grew up. I went to church every time the door was open. And that's what we were taught. And I said, I can't have them in Sunday school because they put out an example that I don't want our kids growing up with. Now, I'm just being blunt here. That's, that's where I'm from, old school. Now, I hide it sometimes, but sometimes I don't. And I said, there ain't no way. And she said, let me talk to them. And she went and talked to our, our dear Seth and Shana. And I figured, well, they're going to get upset. They're leaving. They won't even give us a second chance. Seth, I'm so thankful for you and your wife's spirit. Not only, not only did they get deeply involved in our Sunday school and children's ministries but they are now leading they are our children's pastor not only that but they have done so much in the physical aspect of this church when you look at our nice Sunday school rooms the credit goes all to them amen not only that they became he is a tremendous board member of this church and also a board member at Lufkin Christian Academy amen thank you so much amen and thank you for being such a hard head. I don't, I don't even know how to respond to that. <laughs> Except, yeah. You know, I'm kinda, I kind of get like the junkyard dog sometimes. You know, the Lord tells me to do something. I, I don't want to let go. Pastor Boone, I'm, I'm sorry if I was not very obedient. <laughs> I repent. But I am so proud of them. 
Because a good teacher, the best teacher, produces people that are way better than them. And you know what? Seth and Shane and Basham are way better than I ever hoped to be. They are, they are some phenomenal people. But you know what? Cornerstone, when I come here, Pastor Boone, it still feels like home. <laughs> and we go all over the place now. I don't know if you know it, but you guys are blessed exceedingly abundantly above with the spirit of the Lord and with Pastor Sister Boone. Oh, my Lanta. <laughs> they are they are the best of the best. You have the cream of the crop here. And I know that God has great and mighty things in store for you guys. And I love you all. God is a great God. I have pastored in Oklahoma. I have pastored in Alaska. And I pastored in East Texas. And I was in Texas. This church... I've ever been a part of. The last seven years that I pastored, I kept telling the congregation over and over that the, there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. We are to strive every day to be better than we were yesterday. We need to take that at heart and try to find something that we can do for God and then give it your all. God is in the business of using us. If we'll open up our hearts and our mind and let him, he will use you. No matter where you are in your walk, God has something special for you. Be obedient and listen for the voice of God. He is still talking to men and women to get his message across to a lost and dying world. It is time that we arise for the occasion that has been called upon each and every one of us. I give Pastor Boone all the credit because without him, I would not be where I'm at in my walk. Listen to God and listen to your pastor. He'll direct you in the path that you need to take. And thank you, Cornerstone, for putting your trust in me and my wife. Thank you from the bottom of our heart. taught yesterday and they're teaching our kids today in Power Church. Thank you all for being here. Amen. To all of our guests, thank you for being in the house of the Lord with us today. I trust that you feel the presence of the Lord before you leave here if you haven't already. He is a good God and He is an ever-present help in our time of Amen. This is kind of a weird Sunday for me, so if I don't, if I don't, uh, you know, even the best batter strikes out pretty often. And uh, so I may strike out this morning. My mind is a million directions. Um, of course, you know we've dealt with the passing of some very precious saints. Sometimes it takes that a little while to settle in on me. Um, and then, of course, we've been involved this week in the, in the passing of what we had hoped would be a tremendous miracle. God works in his own way, in his own time. I appreciate your support for Sister Cheryl. She has told me over and over again how much the calls and the texts have meant to her. She's been there in Dallas with her husband as well.
last few days. So continue that. If you can be at that service, it would be wonderful. But I've never done what I'm going to do today. And I, this may sound weird to you, but I guess it's just all, it's the collection of everything over the last three, four months. But I am, I am preaching this funeral this afternoon. And I'm going to be preaching a funeral on my birthday. And I don't think I've ever done that. It's just kind of a, when you look at the big scheme of things, it's just a little bit thought-provoking. And uh, especially when you're not having your 25th birthday or your, when you're getting on up, up there. I used to think 90 was old. God, 90 ain't old at all. 90's just getting started. So, if you want to stand in honor of the Word of God, we'll start with just a couple of scriptures and then you can be seated because I want to read several portions of this. And it's going to be a little confusing because I am reading it from... Uh, the contemporary English version uh, simply no disrespect for the King James but because I don't want to have to go through and explain uh, some of the language is pretty difficult in the King James I don't want to take time to explain it so I'm just going to read it kind of like it'll sound a little bit like a book but 78 and 1 of Psalms this is a, a special Psalm by Asaph he said my friends I beg you to listen as I teach, I will give instruction and explain the mystery of what happened long ago. Now, they're, they're putting the New Living Translation up, so it will also be a little different. He said, verse 3, These are things we learned from our ancestors, and we'll tell them to the next generation, and we won't keep secret the glorious deeds and the mighty miracles of the Lord. God gave his law to Jacob's descendants, the people of Israel, and he told our ancestors to teach their children so that each new generation would know his law and tell it to the next. And then they would trust God and obey his teachings without forgetting anything God has done and that they would be different from their ancestors who were stubborn rebellious and unfaithful to God. I want to preach just for a little bit about our legacy of faith, that it is a sacred trust. Would you pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today? Lord, I love you. I appreciate you and I thank you for your goodness. And God, I thank you for the richness of your presence in this room. There is no question that you are here. There is no question that you are among us. Even though none of us are worthy, all of us with our goodness combined are not worthy to receive the blessings that you give and especially the blessing of your presence and being with us. But we say thank you, Lord. We gratefully thank you for all your goodness. Would you one more time just lift your voice and your hand and thank him for his goodness to you right now. God, I love you. I, I thank you for your presence, God. I thank you for your kindness. You're great and wonderful and greatly to be praised. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to continue. Verse 10, he said, They broke their agreement with God, and they turned their backs on his teaching. They forgot all he had done, even the mighty miracles. He did for their ancestors near Zoan in Egypt. God made a path in the sea and piled up the water as he led them across. And he guided them during the day with a cloud. And each night he led them with a flaming fire. And God made water flow from the rocks he split open in the desert. And his people drank freely as though from a lake. He made streams gush out like rivers from rocks. But in the desert, the people of God Most High kept sinning and kept rebelling. Drop into verse 37. He said, they were unfaithful and broke their promises. Yet God was kind. He kept forgiving their sins and didn't destroy them. He often became angry but never lost his temper. 
God remembered that they were made of flesh and were like a wind that blows once and then dies down. Dropping on to verse 56. But the people tested God. Tested God most high and they refused to obey his laws. They were as unfaithful as their ancestors and they were as crooked as a twisted arrow. Very, very powerful passage of scripture. I've never seen Psalm 78 as I did in light of the legacy of faith as I read through this psalm several times. So, as I said, today's kind of a special day. It's my birthday. And so today, I not only want to celebrate my birthday, but also the blessings of inheritance passed down to me from my parents, my grandparents, and even my great-grandparents. And I want to remind myself, that's why I say this may get a little weird for you, and you may feel like I struck out, because a lot of this I'm preaching today is to me on my birthday. And I want to remind myself of the precious gift of faith and trust in God that has been entrusted to me from previous generations. I want to re-examine the responsibility that we and that I carry to pass on this inheritance to those who come after us. It's been very powerfully put in my mind over the last 48 hours because for the first time in his life uh, Lucas who is I guess eight months old uh, spent the night away from his mom and dad and we kept him that night I don't know I think Chelsea missed him more than he missed her I'm not sure uh, I, I heard her feelings when she came back to get him. I said, I don't know that he even missed you. That wasn't a thing to tell your daughter. But as I kept him, and he, he has, a, he has a, a problem with sleeping sometimes. And in the middle of the night, we were up and in the chair. And even when he's not asleep in the middle of the night, he's not crying and fussing and snotting and, and bad man. No, he smiles all night long. He is just smi- He's cheesing from ear to ear at 4 o'clock in the morning. And you want to say what Chelsea told him one time. Stop smiling at me. But as I held this smiling child at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, it was brought to me again. I'm not going to be here forever. I am. I am on my way out of here. And I have a responsibility to pass something to my grandchildren and to your children and to your grandchildren. It's a legacy of faith uh, and it is a sacred trust. When you talk about a trust, uh, a trust fund is like a sacred trust because it involves the serious duty of taking care of something valuable and you're taking care of it for someone else until they can learn to appreciate it. Just as a sacred trust is a solemn commitment to protect and preserve what's important, a trust fund carries a responsibility to safeguard assets for the benefit of another with great care and honesty. And I humbly recognize that many of you were not as blessed as I am concerning who brought you into this world and your lineage. Let me just say to those of you whose parents have not been what a parent should be, your ultimate creator is God who loves you with a matchless love and continues to reach for you with amazing grace. His love conquers all and His grace is sufficient. So if you didn't win the lottery with parents or grandparents and you're here today, you have won the lottery with your heavenly Father who brought you here because He loves you and He don't miss and He don't fail. Would you give Him a hand of praise right now? He's always faithful. He's good all the time. All the time He's good. But I am blessed with an inheritance of faith from my parents, my grandparents, and even my great parents. Uh, It's a foundation of faith, and I stand here today because of that foundation. It was their prayers and their teachings and their example uh, that have been passed down to me uh, 
it's not just a set of beliefs uh, to me, but it's a legacy of love and of grace uh, and of dedication and of compassion. Uh, and their unconditional love and their dedication to serving God has left its incredible and indelible mark on my life. Uh, the lessons that were learned through their experiences and their wisdom, I have learned valuable lessons about perseverance and forgiveness uh, and the power of prayer and their stories of faithfulness continue to inspire and to guide me in my walk with God. And therefore, something is required of me. The Bible said, to whom much is given, much is required. And I have the responsibility of passing on my inheritance. And so how do I do that? I I have got to be intentional about what I teach and I preach. Uh, just as my parents and my grandparents shared their faith uh, and it got to me, I'm called uh, to intentionally teach and nurture the next generation in the ways of the Lord. Uh, we're entrusted with the task of passing on uh, the timeless truths of the gospel. I've got to be a living example. Our responsibility goes beyond words. It requires us to be living examples of God's love and His mercy. Our actions and our attitudes should reflect the faith that we, that, we, that we profess, showing others the power of life that's surrendered to God. When your life is surrendered to God, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. Does that make you perfect? No, but it sure makes you repentant. fervently pray for the spiritual growth and protection of those who come after us. Our prayers can pave the way for God's work in the heart of future generations.
as we, old Peter, he was sticking to his guns, honey. He preached that first message on the day of Pentecost, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And he never backed up on that message. He said, hey, you guys have received the Holy Ghost. Let's get some water that these should be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost. And he suggested to them, he said, I got a great idea. Uh uh-uh. uh. He still remembered the fire that flowed through him on the day of Pentecost, and the anointing of God gave him a clear message. So he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stick around and, and teach and preach a few days. You see, Cornelius' family and his friends were saved because Cornelius prayed desperately to God, and God heard him. You hear me? God still has my parents' tears bottled up. And he still hears their prayers. And it's truly amazing. And you and, and here's the deal. Some of you what, what some of you may not realize, Kais, I know a little bit about your heritage. But you only know a few generations. What you don't know, Kais Forhat, you listen to me. What you don't know is that some of your family actually could have been there. You may have been benefiting from prayers prayed 10, 12, 14 generations ago. And we forget about that. We don't understand that. But God never forgets. When God hears that prayer, He hears that prayer, and He hears that prayer, and He hears that prayer. And there comes a time when things are right in the perfect timing of God that He pours out His answers. He pours out His Spirit. Amen. You can do that for your family. You can have the power of an intercessor. Never give up. Keep praying. Keep believing. One of my favorite pictures that comes up on my phone that that just rotates through my family pictures is the picture of my wife knelt right there in early morning prayer. That picture, it moves me every time it comes on my phone. Honey, you need to be a prayer warrior. You need to understand what's been entrusted to you. You didn't get this by yourself. Somebody prayed this into you. Somebody touched God for you. And we got to touch God for somebody else my legacy of faith amen so as I celebrate my birthday I'm also reflecting on the the wonderful privilege and responsibility of passing on the inheritance of faith and trust in God and we've got to be faithful stewards of the rich legacy we have received whether we're first generation second third generation believers, spirit-filled believers. It doesn't matter what generation you are. We've got to be faithful stewards. It's our responsibility to nurture and cultivate it for the glory of God and the blessing of those who will follow in our footsteps. I'm just going to ask by way, uh, uh, you might have to think about this for, for just a minute, to being a spirit-filled believer. Now, you got to understand, let me give you just a real short history lesson. Uh, so, on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out. Man, those people shouted. They danced. They talked in tongues. They had miracles, signs, wonders. They had explosive church. They, the Bible said in places that, it was the, that the place was shaken where they prayed. It was such powerful prayer going on that the place was shaken. Amen. They, they had more of a house church. You see, where, uh, you see where one guy was sitting in a windowsill one day. That's pretty casual. He just sitting up in the window, and the preacher was kind of like me, bored him to tears. He went to sleep and fell out of the window, fell down two or three floors, uh, killed him. They prayed him back alive. That's church right there, ladies and gentlemen. And, and I'm going to just go, I'm gonna go a little step further because this is my job. This is my responsibility. My granddad, 
my, my granddad started many, many churches, uh, and they did it under a tent. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm wearing it this morning. I'm wearing the outfit, uh, but this outfit we wear sometimes scares people to death. Uh, they're just seeing a bunch of dressed up people, uh, and they don't understand because where we were born, ladies and gentlemen, was under old tents uh, where it was sweaty uh, and where people just came in their work clothes, uh, and they just grabbed their kids. And somewhere along the line, the devil told us, you need to wear your best to church you need to look good and when we started looking good people in the world started losing interest and you can get mad at me all you want to but my God when people come to this place it don't matter what they're dressed like they better feel welcome here they better know they're welcome here we don't need high pollutant we need the dirt my God have mercy I looked at these little kids all at my feet when I was worshiping. Some people don't like that. That's a distraction to them. Honey, I tell you what you can do. If that's a distraction to you, you go find you a dead church uh, that are losing their kids because uh, we ain't backing up. Uh, they're welcome here. Uh, we want them here. Uh, we want them in our altars. You see, I'm not here to please you. I'm here for the next generation because when we started slapping our kids and pinching them in church every time they moved, we started turning them off to church. I know where I'm at, and I'm not afraid. And we started saying church became a prison. And that's why we got hundreds and hundreds of backslidden children because it was no fun to come to church. My God, I'm not having it. This is going to be a place where our children feel welcome and loved. I don't care what generation you are. You see, we bought some stuff along the way. If you want to know what church looked like, honey, you better go back to the book of Acts. Don't you dare go back to some straight lace something that we came out of. On my best day, I cannot see a mother in the New Testament book of Acts church going out in the yard and telling her kids, y'all come in and get dressed, it's time to go to church. If you can see that in your head, then you got a bigger imagination than I do. The church was meshed with the home. It was The church a lot of times was even in the home. When we got in here and built our walls and got all fancied up, we're going to an event, y'all. And the world don't need an event. They need a church that still brings the fire. I know some of you are going to have to think long and hard about this, and you may want to go somewhere else. I get it. I've had to grow into this myself. But I've also had to face the responsibility that what these kids are facing in the hallways of their school and what they're facing in their neighborhoods, I better reach as far as I can to make them welcome in this church. There better not be anything I do that's just because of an old tradition that has nothing to do with the Scripture. I've got to make them as welcome and as warm as this place can be because the devil is bidding for them. It's my birthday. Did I tell you all that? It's our responsibility to nurture and to cultivate for the glory of God and the blessing of those who will follow in our footsteps. And we got to give them the word. If tradition matches the word, then give them the tradition. But if the tradition don't fit in the book, then don't idolize it. We need to commit to investing in the spiritual well-being of our families, our communities, and future generations. And it's our responsibility to do our best 
And by the way, I will tell you, parents, please stop your kids from running like a striped ape, or I will. They can get away with a lot of stuff here, but I don't like them running through our old people's legs like a bullet. So if you don't help me, I will. Okay? I'll go on. We got to invest in the spiritual well-being of our families and our communities and our future generations. And it's our, it's our responsibility to do our best to see that the light of God's love continues to shine brightly through us into future generations. And we need to pray that God would grant us the wisdom and the grace and the strength to carry out this critical task with diligence and with devotion. I'm I'm still hung on it. God, we may not get through today. (laughs) Do you know how impressionable children are? Do y'all know what, is it the the stank eye or the stank eye? What is it? Huh? S-T. How many of you growing up, you older generation, remember getting the stank eye? You even moved back in the day. Is there anything welcoming to a child about that? And do you know how impressionable children are? Oh, yeah, you stuck it to them, all right. They stuck it to you, you set straight, and you're still trying to pass that on to somebody else. Happy birthday to me. I don't know what was said, and I don't want to know. Oh, there we go. Somebody's quick back there. (laughs) Have you all read this week how easy it is for a child to get their gender changed? surgery without the permission of the parent do you realize what's being pushed on this generation honey we got to stick with that book do you hear me we have to stick with that book but if we got stuff we're trying to push on another generation that we didn't get from that book we got to back out ladies and gentlemen because the whole truth it's got to be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth there's just as much of a warning for adding to as there is for taking away Paul wrote to Timothy You see, Paul was already seeing this happen. So you remember where Paul tells him, he said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from what I taught you. It blows my mind how fast, even in his lifetime, 50 years or so, it had been removed. And you know the rest of the story. You see what happened, and tradition started taking over, and and, and the, the spirit that had been released when Jesus died on the cross and the veil was rent, then the ministry started trying to take that back in and say, you can't talk to God on your own. You've got to have a priest. And you can't read the Bible for yourself. Listen, people were killed because they had a little piece of the Scripture that they were reading for themselves. And they took that away. The church took that away. And, and the apostles were saying, I can't believe you're falling for this. I can't believe you're going. And the church just kept stumbling down until we end up in the dark ages. And nobody can move. Nobody has freedom there is very little outpouring of the spirit we don't even have a record of it I'm sure there was there because there's always been a remnant but it was cloistered and it was put into a formalism and you had to bow and scrape and do this and do that and thank God for a man named Martin Luther who was willing to risk his life and say we gotta get somewhere besides where we are we gotta get back to the book And they killed him because he broke with their traditions. But he saw in the book, uh, we've got to get this. Uh, We've let this go. We've got to have it back. Uh, And so Martin Luther uh, brought us what we call the Lutherans. 
And from out of this dark age, Martin Luther took one step up. He said, no, nope, it's grace. It's not works. It's faith. And then another came behind him. And the Anabaptists showed up and they said, there's more. There's more there in that book that we've been missing. And another group said, there's more there in that book that we've been missing. You wondered where the denominations came from. The denominations came because Luther started a process of getting back to the book. And every denomination that comes along keeps seeing there's something more. And so the Pentecostals showed up and they said, we believe you can still talk in tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. And an old man, some in Kansas, some in California, prayed for days and days and days on a Zoom. Street in California they prayed and all of a sudden the Holy Ghost fell and the Spirit of God fell on them and they began to receive the Holy Ghost like the Jews said about Cornelius they got it just like they got it on the day of Pentecost it was poured out and then somebody come along with them and they said you know I see wherever where they baptized in the New Testament they called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back and do that. Somebody recognized their responsibility. Do you recognize yours? Paul wrote to Timothy, his son, in the gospel, and he said, I thank God whom I serve. From my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee. He's talking to Timothy, his son. I want to see you, being mindful of thy tears, and that I may be filled with joy. He said, Timothy, when I think about you, I can't help but call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that's in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. And then your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that that's put into you also. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And I'm grateful to have the testimony that Timothy had. I'm grateful for that. Had Paul been addressing me, writing a letter to me, he would have said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy great-grandmother, Etta May, and Ruth Lee, your grandmother, and thy mother, Sarah, and I am persuaded that it's in thee also. My mother was third generation, spirit filled, Jesus' name, water baptized. My great grandmother, my great grandmother witnessed to a young man and won him to the Lord. And that young man was Otto Seba Owens and became my grandmother's husband. My great grandmother witnessed and won my grandmother's future husband to the Lord. And my mother was truly a woman who loved, loved Jesus. Mom, I'm preaching today. On the day that you gave birth to me, and I'm trying to hold on, Mom. I'm caught between two worlds, and I need your wisdom to lead a church through the end time. I read her diary day or two after she passed away I was asked to preach her funeral she had asked that and as I read through her diary all through her diary she spoke fondly of working for the Lord 
nursing home services for me and the upset today, God, God, so many memories came back. <sighs> nursing home services, she, she loved to work in that nursing home. She loved to sing and encourage those people. Kids ministry, my mom loved kids ministry. My, my wife makes me mad because she's just like my mom. I'd lose my wife to this church if I didn't fight so hard for her. She would always be doing something here or working with you and, and doing so. I have to fight for my own wife because my wife has her grandmother in here who was not a minister's wife, but she loved the work of God. Outreach. My mom, my, I sang. I, I started, people tell me, oh, you do such a good job singing at funerals and preaching funerals. Honey, there ought, I ought to. I started singing at them at five and hearing messages, funeral messages all my life, sitting behind the curtain, cutting jokes, but having to hear at the same time. You hear me. Kids can cut up and hear at the same time. Stop worrying about it. I sat behind that curtain many times, <laughs> little music room, and my dad right there, and we were having to cover our mouth because we were snickering about something that was going on. And yet I didn't forget it, Josh. <laughs> it stuck in my heart, and I couldn't get away from it. Funerals and hospital visitation and home visits and ladies' ministries and learning new songs to sing for the church. I've told you all that very comical routine when the old song, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Bah, 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 soon and very soon. I mean, Andre Crouch had that, he had that black move in his voice. I mean, it was cool. Uh, so we were going to sing that at our church, and my mama was going to play it for us. And it sounded like, the music to when we all get to heaven and the words to soon and very soon. And when we tried to sing it at church, my sister and I got so tickled. And my wife, you talking about the stank eye. We were laughing so hard we finally had to leave the platform. And you talking about a chewing when we got done. But my mom just was trying. She was trying. She always wanted to learn. She always wanted to help. Always wanted to be a part of the work of God. Christmas program, she loved it on and on and in her diary she spoke often of the moving of the spirit of God in the services she rejoiced in her diary every Monday after they had a, a good move of God in the services and she was always so excited when they had a good move of God's spirit and it thrilled her when they had a good altar service she would write about it and it concerned her when nobody received the Holy Ghost for a while or as she would say nobody prayed through that bothered her and so I read now straight from her diary. And she writes, some, some way when I was writing in my diary, these pages stuck together and I didn't write on them. So I thought I'd just write you a letter, Jesus. I love you so very much. You've always been so dependable, so strong and patient, loving and understanding and kind. She said, I knew I wanted to serve you when I first met you because the devil has nothing at all to offer. But you have everything, Lord. You have mansions and streets of gold. And I'm sure I cannot imagine the real beauties of heaven. So, Lord, don't let me fall. I don't want to fail you. I want to be a real Christian. And she had in parentheses a creek with water. <laughs> Sorry about that. You East Texas mud boggers don't understand why she said that. Because out where we were raised, it was more common to have a creek that didn't have water than one that did. And so they always laughed about a creek that didn't have water. And so when my mom was writing to Jesus, she said, I don't want to fail you. I want to be a real Christian. I want to be a creek with water. Honey, I'm telling you, I don't want to be one thing by name and not have it flowing in me. I don't want to say I got the Holy Ghost and yet it not be flowing in me. It's my heritage. 
She said, I want to be an overcomer daily. Help me, Jesus, to be an untiring worker for you. I want to be a better Christian, Lord, a better teacher, a better pianist, a better pastor's wife, a better ladies' auxiliary president, a better mother, and a better relative. She wrote, this is her letter straight to God. She said, help me be better in all these things and to be a more thoughtful person to others. And Lord, save my children, Randy and Linda and Danny and Susan, John and Roy. In Jesus' holy name, I ask these things of you. Signed, Sarah Boone. She also wrote out her funeral plans concerning how she was to be dressed, her clothing, her hair, etc. And she was very specific about how to be dressed, desiring modesty and godliness. She didn't want them painting her up or putting a bunch of jewelry on her. She said, I want to be just like I am in life. And she listed the songs she wanted sung hand in hand with Jesus. And it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. And I quote again from her diary. Jesus has been good to me over and over again. I put my trust in him. He's never failed me, not one time ever. She said, we preach our funeral each day by the way we live our lives, by what we do for Jesus and how we treat others. She wrote to she said, to my husband Pete, my children Randall, Daniel, Randall, Daniel, Susan, and John, Linda, Phyllis, Jim, and Karen. By this time, my wife was in the picture. My grandchildren, Roy, Derek, Rhonda, Sarah Lynn, Zachary, Cody, Cheryl, and Courtney, Galen, Chelsea, and whosoever my great-grandchildren are born in the future. Let's all meet in heaven. It's going to last forever. She said, we'll never part there in that beautiful city where there's peace, joy, love, and everything good for eternity. I love all of you, Sarah, Mama, Nina. Hoping he would find it after she passed, she wrote my dad on September 17, the year 2000, 19 years prior to her passing. And she said this. And the way she ends it is good advice for all of us. She said, Pete. That's what my dad's nickname was. She said, Pete, I've had a beautiful life with you. You gave me all the necessary things. Not everything I ever wanted, but everything I ever needed. We've been happy together. Not always agreeing on everything, but always loving one another. Put your complete trust in Jesus and live out your life with him and meet me in heaven. I know you'll grieve a while, but don't let it get you down. Jesus can be everything in your life that you ever need. I love you very much, and I want us to be together in heaven. Love, Sarah. See, there's challenges faced by third, fourth, and fifth generation Christians. I want to get a feel right now. Just, I want to know how many of you, you are the first person in, in your family that you know of that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, and you've been baptized in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. How many of you are the very first generation? Would you stand? Because I certainly want to honor you. Would you just say, and my God, thank you. Thank you. Give them a hand. Because mm. you faced the condemnation of your family. Many of you have been outcast because you went for this gospel. You see, that's what happened to my parents, my dad, my granddad. His family told him, don't ever come back. You're disowned because you're going to go after that outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Remember I told you about the steps back into the early church, uh, starting with Luther. When my granddad took that step into being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they disowned him. What a shame people can't open their mind to the Bible and say, if it's in there, then let me have it. If it's in the book, why not? How many of you are second generation? In other words, your parents had, 
had this, they led the way for you. Your parents were in this first. Would you raise your hand? Second generation. Second generation. How about third generation? Wow. I want you to I want you to hold your hand up just a minute. Third generation. I want you to look at each other. How about fourth generation? Do we have any fifth generation? Wow. And sixth generation. You say you got Lucas in your hand. He's in the nursery. Lucas is sixth generation. And you really expect me to trade what's in this book to be popular with this world? I have a legacy of faith. I have been given a sacred trust. That's why there were some people here in this church one time, and they thought because I'm so forward thinking and I'm out of the box, they thought I was going somewhere else, and they were excited. And you may remember the business meeting when I confronted and I said, I promise you, uh, I am not going anywhere. If you're going that way, you can go. Uh, but I've got a legacy. I've got parents and grandparents and great-grandparents uh, who took ridicule. Uh, my granddaddy had rotten eggs thrown in. You want to know why I push for worship? Uh, because my granddaddy uh, and the revivals that he had, they worshiped God with liberty. They danced. They shouted. Uh, they clapped their hands. Hands, uh, and they got rotten eggs thrown at them uh, and rotten tomatoes uh, by the traditional Christians uh, who said that was demonic and that was outrageous uh, and you expect me uh, to act like that group uh, who was throwing eggs uh, at my granddaddy uh, when he fought uh, for the freedom to dance uh, when he fought uh, for the freedom to shout uh, you sit there if you want to uh, you act like them if you want to uh, I'm a Pentecostal. You can act like a denomination if you so desire. But I've been given a freedom to worship like they did in the New Testament. I've been given the freedom to lift my hands and shout. And praise God and sing to the top of my lungs. And you expect me to act like the people that was throwing eggs and cutting my granddaddy's tents? You expect me to act like the people that was opposed to my granddaddy that was given everything to get us back to the book of Acts? Put that happy birthday back up. So these people know I'm nice. And I want to talk to you. I know what time it is. If you've got to go, you go. I'm not quitting yet. If you need to go, I fully get it. You have a schedule. I don't normally do this. You are my witness. I don't usually do this, but I can't stop right now. You see the challenges faced by third Fourth and fifth generation Christians are real and they are dangerous. Again, third generation, fourth generation, fifth. Raise your hand, all of y'all together. Third, fourth, fifth. They are real and they're dangerous. And there is such a danger of losing the zeal for God that previous generations had. It's complex and it's multifaceted. And I want to share some key factors contributing to this dangerous struggle. Number one, first and foremost, it becomes old hat to us. Because when I was a baby, I'd lay under a pew and dodge the heels as the ladies were dancing. And to me, it can easily just become old hat. It's people that say, I'm scared of a Pentecostal church because they do all that stuff. Honey, I ain't scared of it at all. I slept right through it. I still do. Mike does occasionally. First generation Christians were saved. You understand, all you first generation, raise your hand. You were saved from the miry clay 
you came out of sin and often you came out of sinful broken home environments then the second generation comes along and they witness the change in their parents so they were there to see their parents come out of the world second generation watched it happen they watched their mom and dad quit cussing and fighting and throwing things and and coming home drunk they witnessed that and so it thrills their soul that second generation got to see that happen how God changes their family for the better and they have such a great appreciation but third fourth fifth generations are often raised in homes where they do not have the privilege of seeing firsthand how God healed their home and saved their family or worse they've seen tragic hypocrisy in the home parents who are one thing at church and something completely different at home and growing up in a Christian environment from previous generations can sometimes lead to a sense of familiarity that breeds contempt and the routine nature of faith practices or teachings our worship our giving all that may dull the sense of excitement and passion for God and at times third fourth and fifth generation Christians feel pressure to conform to family expectations or traditions without understanding because unfortunately there was a generation that said do it because I said so I promise you you'll never hear that coming out of this pastor just because you said so is not good enough if the book can't back it honey you better shut your mouth don't you try to drag some tradition over somebody's head or some personal conviction that God gave you and say this is Bible shame on you same place it says taken away says adding to is just as David at times, these third and fourth and fifth generations feel the pressure to conform without understanding. And this scenario can create a superficial adherence to faith without a personal, deep-rooted connection to God. Do you understand what I'm saying? You wonder now why some of these people can just go and walk away from this and what we say, walk away from truth. It's Many times, it's because it never was in them to start with. It was on them and forced on them but it never got in them third fourth gen fourth generation is such a critical place another great challenge to zeal and dedication is a sense of isolation or lack of authentic connection and community within the church ladies and gentlemen we've got to create connection and community for our kids and our grandkids We've got to create a non-condemning, supporting, forgiving atmosphere for our children. Our children need to know that there is nothing so bad they can do that they cannot come back to this church and be loved and be hugged and be cared for. They got to know that. Without meaningful relationships and support systems, future generations will struggle to maintain their spiritual fervor. And we've got to protect the move of the Spirit of God by being a praying and a worshiping church. You know why you don't feel like worshiping? Because the devil don't want you worshiping and your flesh don't want you worshiping. But you hear me, I will drive you crazy and I will run you off before I let you just sit there without understanding the power of worship and praise and giving glory to God. We got a freedom. We got a liberty. We can shout. We can praise God. Come on, third, fourth, fifth generation. How many of you remember the old sour puss in church? Raise your hand. You still remember that old bag. Don't be that old bag. You men, don't be that old buzzard. My God, when these little kids see you at church, you need to look like you're enjoying yourself, not your wife drug you here. Some, where are you caught? Come here. Get off the, no, but yeah, both of you, come on. I got, I got 10 more pages of this mess. 
Save me, Carlos. Get up. Oh, God, I just knew I could do this. I knew I could finish, but I'm not. As good a place as any to quit, I'll teach the rest of it on Wednesday night. I know half of you won't hear it, but oh well. Put it back, put it back, let them know I'm a nice guy. Lord, I'm good looking. It is 15 years ago. I'm going to close this, otherwise I'm fixing it. Because I worked really hard for that message. And just leave half of it laying there. It's like, ugh! I, I, I refer to another song that made, made its way through our ranks through the years. Take me back. Take me back to the place where I first received you. Take me back. I know I've cut up and I've said a lot. Probably about half didn't need to be said. But mom, oh God, mom, if you knew the struggles I'm having right now, they're much worse than what I had when I was 14 or 15. Fighting for all I'm worth, mom. devil don't want this kind of church surviving. The devil don't want a church where anybody can walk in and feel welcome no matter what they look like or smell like. Mom, the devil don't want a church where our kids feel warmth and love and freedom. There's a reason that Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of churches are closing their doors and their, their attendance is declining, y'all. Because you can't get away from how God designed the church and expect it to last. On what level does that not make sense? I'm not going to name denominations, but they're everywhere. I've had him talk to me just lately. I had a man telling me the other day, just a few days ago, he said, oh God, I wish we still had kids in our church. I'm talking, I'm not going to throw a name right now, but probably one of the wealthiest people in this community. He said, I'm so proud you guys are still able to keep kids in your church growing. He said, we went past that. And I'm not talking about just little kids, y'all. <laughs> no, no. I'm talking about kids like this one. I'm talking about kids like this one. You irritate me sometimes. We'll talk about it. You go so against the grain of what I was taught in some areas. But I love you so much. And I want you to know that this is your home forever. And if you don't ever get exactly like I think, that's okay. It's between you and God. You leave my beliefs alone. But we're going to keep walking together. Do you understand me? This is one of my kids. Do you understand that? I don't want her hurt. I don't hurt her wounded. She's got to know this place loves her with everything in her. Come here. This is one of my kids. I know he don't have it all together. I know he's still struggling with some stuff. But this is my kid. hear me, this church will always welcome you, no matter what happens, no matter the ups and downs, this is home to you, mom, I 
I'm trying. I know, I know all that, and I know where we're going, and I'm trying to hold it together. (laughs) Take me back. Take me back to the place where I first received you. Y'all remember that old song we used to sing back in the historical days? Makes me love everybody. Well, honey, if you love everybody, you don't talk about them behind their back. If you you love them, you don't run them down. That's what I'm talking about. Take me back. Take me back where when I got the Holy Ghost. I just loved everybody. I couldn't wait to get to church. I was excited about praying. And honey, if there's not another third, fourth, fifth generation that struggles to maintain that, please come tell me your secret. Because it's a battle. It's a battle. I hope y'all can perform a miracle. Go for it. Would you stand, church? I'm done. Take me back. This altar's open if you Take need to renew something. Back, this altar's to open if you need to rethink something. This altar's open if you uh, want to be a first generation. Receive Take the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you want to be the Take first in your family back, to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this altar is yours. You can have the Holy Ghost today. Take me back. I'm gonna get back, Lord. Take me back, dear Lord. Yeah. Sing it, sing it, dad, sing it. My God, take me back, Jesus. Take me back. I'm gonna get back, Lord. that some of you second, third, fourth generation need a renewing just about as bad as I do. I really believe the Holy Ghost could flood this place. I wish we could fill in this whole altar area right now. I wish you would just pray one for another that the fire of heaven would fall on us. We've gone through church splits. We've gone through hurts. We've watched pastors backslide. We've seen everything under the sun. We've had prayers that didn't get answered the way we wanted them to. But Honey, there's still fresh fire for third, fourth, fifth generation Pentecostals. Somebody wants the fire. Pray for one another now, yeah.
what time it is. Feel no, feel no shame. You can go whenever. But if you need a, a renewing of your second, third, fourth generation, you need a renewing of the Holy Ghost. I'm opening up this very front and center. I'm going there to start with because if I've ever needed a renewing of the Holy Ghost, I need it now. But if some of you want to join me and some of you first generation want to lay hands on me, I'm asking you to lay hands on me and pray that the fire of heaven gets a hold of me again. Renew my mind. Renew my spirit. I've got to be renewed. 